as usual, I talked to my amazing wife, Laura, and she's like, this is a bad idea. You should totally do this. Quite a few times on camera, I have said that the last 2904 was the last 2904. And I stand by that. But I didn't specify that it would be my last Cannonball event. I purchased one of the 12 or two remaining Audi Quattro Cannonball Brock Yates cars, number 11. And my promise was that I was going to Cannonball it because the original owner never got a chance to do that. In order to fulfill that destiny, I had to come up with an event. So my friend, Pierce Plam, who has done multiple cannonballs with me, he's, he's, he's made as many bad decisions as I have, maybe a few more that I don't know about, but we've been friends since high school. He calls me up and says, you know, there's another run out there and I think we should do it. I'm like, what is it? He's like, you know, all these fast guys and high powered cars, what if we do a slower version of that? What if it's low powered cars? Because it's got to be a gimmick. 2904 was budget. It was $2,904. And he's like, low power cars. I'm like, okay. And he's like, here's a name for you. Instead of a cannonball, we call it musket ball. Because it's slower, smaller, and a lot more inaccurate. I'm like, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. All right. Damn it. So now I start planning in my head a whole nother event. And having done eight of these things, it starts, your head starts clicking. I start getting through the list. I'm like, do I really want to do this? Is this a good idea? Answer to that is always no. As usual, I talk to my amazing wife, Laura, and she's like, this is a bad idea. You should totally do this. I'm like, ah, because technically I'm putting my livelihood at risk running what is essentially, well, all, the, all this is essentially is alleged. I'm allegedly doing this. This isn't Senator, I'm not saying I actually did put on this event. Allegedly, if I had put on this event, the liability of it, the ulcers you get from worrying about all of it, it's not, ter it's not really worth it. But I made a promise to cannonball the Audi. So I was going to do that. As you do nowadays, you just create a Facebook page and you invite a few people going, I have a really bad idea. Would you like to join me in my bad idea? Would you like to make a hugely poor choice with me? And of course, people are like, yes. There's been a backlog of people who wanted to do 2904 since that was over with. And the C2C Express ended in 2019. So there hasn't been a group cannonball in a few years. And the purpose was to, one, fulfill my promise to the Audi, to show that, again, a cheap, slow car can come within a nice percentage of all these idiots with their high powered quarter million dollar attempt machines and you can do it. So the musket ball was set at a horsepower rating of less than hundred horsepower. I've always wanted to do a Le Mans start. Now the Le Mans start is from the race in France and back 69 and earlier, they get all the racers on the racetrack, line them up and on the other side of the track would be their race cars and the flag would go and they'd have to run across the racetrack hop in the race car and take off, which usually wasn't a great idea because they wouldn't put their seatbelts on or anything like that. But I'm thinking, I want to do a Le Mans start. I want to start everybody at the same time. Just to watch a herd of middle-aged men running to middle-aged cars and trying to get out of a small parking lot is entertainment enough to put on a run like this. You know, the other things I wanted to do was make sure that it was about the fun of it, that it wasn't about the time, that we just had a good time. So I wanted the field to be really eclectic and weird. I wanted the drivers to be experienced so we wouldn't have to worry about beginners. And because I've been doing this for so long, I could really almost handpick the folks I wanted to go and bring in a few wild cards just to keep everybody on their toes. And the run was going to be from the Good Wives in Connecticut to the Portofino. And this fulfilled one of my other requirements was that it was the 50th anniversary of the first competitive cannonball. And that was in November 15th, 1971. So 
people are like, what date are we going? I'm like, we're going November 15th and it's going to be 50 years on the dot and we're going to leave just like they did. And people are like, well, what time? Because timing of going across the country is essential because when you get into LA can ruin you, which is exactly what I wanted. So if people were too fast, I wanted them to go right through LA traffic. So we started at 10 o'clock in the morning, which if you went too quickly, it would get you right in the rush hour in LA. So that was kind of like a built-in penalty. There were a lot of penalties. So the date is set the day before we meet at the Shop CT, which is this really cool tuner shop in Connecticut, only a few miles from where we were staying. And all the cars start rolling in. And this was exciting because some people didn't tell me what they were bringing. And most of the field had no idea what was going to be showing up. There was a Suzuki miniature van, which arrived the night before on the back of a flatbed from like North Carolina because it wasn't running yet. And it was dressed up like the Transcom Medevac from the Cannonball Run movie, which also ran in the 79 Cannonball. And it was wrapped perfectly. It was Amazing. I, again, I would have thrown the whole race just to have this little critter in it. And they're there at the star party trying try to get it running. All the other teams are coming over and trying to lend advice. They're trying to get it going. We're going to dyno the cars. And how they got dynoed was I gave everybody a lobster sticker. And you would put the sticker on the car you thought was going to cheat the most. So some of them gathered many stickers. Doug and Arnie show up in a first generation Honda Insight, which is a slippery little car with a Volkswagen diesel inside of it. So to watch that come up going, clack, 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 clack. as soon as they pull in, people are like, oh crap. Doug and Arnie are in here in like the cheatiest of cheaty cars. Honestly, at that point, I was just trusting people because you can't police the whole thing. It's just for fun. If you're doing, going to cheat, and I pointed this out early, if you're gonna cheat, you're missing the idea of the whole thing. The penalties for every horsepower you went over was 10 pounds of cement in the car. Because the math is a horsepower is about 10 pounds in a race car. On top of that, they had to do a 1,000 piece puzzle the night before. So we take a little bit of sleep away from them and tape it to the hood of their car. So there are three cars with puzzles on the hoods. And most people were totally into the spirit of it. And Ed Bolian shows up with a rental car. I was hoping somebody would get a rental car. He gets a Toyota Corolla. He was trying to get something else and they didn't have it because you can't arrange the specific car from a thing. So he was battling with these rental guys. He shows up with a Corolla with a CVT transmission. And these are cars that never should go on a dyno. So it's Ed's car. So of course people want that dyno. It gets on there. The CVT is like wheezing. It's like, ah, 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 and it just misses 100 horsepower. Three cars would go over 100 horsepower. One of them was hilarious because it only went over one horsepower, I believe. And it was a relatively new Toyota Prius. Again, not a car that should ever, like the car didn't know what it was doing on a dyno. This is interesting. If you own a Prius, the sport mode, the power mode actually makes less power, we found out. And he went to 101 horsepower with it. And he had like a 60 gallons of fuel in the back of it. And he was going to try to go nonstop. The field was bizarre. Jared from Wrench Every Day, and his buddies show up in a short bus, a diesel short bus, with a stripper pole in it. And they're one of the support vehicles. It was great because when the start lines up and you get all this weird hardware there, there's no clear favorite. Like anybody could have won. So time comes, all the cars are lined up behind good wives. They're parked in the corner so that nobody has a clear advantage and you can exit in either direction. And our starter is John Harrison, who's been the Grand Marshal of the 2904 since the beginning. He's an original cannonball runner in 79 and a bloody legend and a good friend of mine. So he's going to start everybody. 10 o'clock comes. Everybody's crowded up around John. We've got the, the clock and go. And the scene is beautiful. And I... I just stood there and watched because that's, that's what I paid my money for. I just wanted to see this. There are people running everywhere and there's a cloud of smoke and they're off. And we hop in the Audi after everybody leaves and take off after them. Now, talking about Cannonball is usually one of the most boring things in the world. I mean, honestly, you probably have watched some videos on it. It's 
talking about driving 3,000 miles is literally like, and then we stopped for gas, and then we drove, and then we stopped for gas, and we drove. This start and the slow cars changed everything. I've never been on a run like this in my life. We come out and we drove about 10 miles before we caught the slowest car, which I think was the Yaris. I mean, who's crazy enough to drive a Toyota Yaris? Just literally every day as a commuter car, you're crazy to drive one of those. Drive one of those across the country, God bless you. We catch the Yaris, we catch a couple of the cars, we catch the bus. As we start going over the bridge, there's a big bridge above New York City. We're like, got the bus, here we go. We so pull by the bus. The bus reacts by jumping in the bus lane. There is a dedicated bus lane. I'm like, that's fair, <laughs> that's fair. And I mean, as fast as I think it go, which is probably like 80 miles an hour, or 87 miles an hour, that old diesel short bus is just tearing down, blowing by everybody. What happened was, and this was really the fun part, is cars found each other of a similar speed and driving style and grouped up. And we were all on a program, you can watch people drive online, and you could see all the dots, and the dots started getting into little groups. And of course, Bolian's out front, right? And Arnie and Doug, the choice has to be made at some point whether you go north or you go south. There's two ways of getting across the country. I did not choose the northern route, and I gotta say, I made a conscious choice to drive through Oklahoma. This was a very, as people know me, very difficult choice to make. I took the southern route. Because the northern route, you spend more time at altitude. We get to about Indianapolis, and everybody's kind of set up in groups. We've been on the road for hours now. And we are grouped with a Volvo uh, 240, which is a great choice, and probably about the same horsepower and aerodynamics as the Audi, and a Jetta. We drove together for about a thousand miles. And I mean, within sight of each other and passing each other. And then somebody would pull over for gas and pull out. And we were legitimately racing across the country. We were like looking next to each other, like, you know, you're flooring your 100 horsepower car and you're, eh, eh, eh. and top speed for the Audi was 112 miles an hour because I didn't want to push the RPMs too high. I think the Volvo had a little bit more grunt up the hills and we had a little bit more straightaway or something. We'd catch them and the Jetta was there. We're duking it out. It was so much fun. Like I think for an hour and a half, allegedly, the three cars in the middle of the night were doing over 100 miles an hour for an hour and a half, allegedly. And it was sublime. That hour and a half was worth the whole thing. The perfect time of drive for me is between two and six o'clock in the morning. The reason for that is it's after all the drunk stops, bar get out, cop things, but between midnight and two and six o'clock, which is rush hour. And for those four hours, I think most parts of the country, you really can haul some butt. And we were just ringing these old cars out without an issue, like no problems. Meanwhile, there's 25 other cars blasting across and we're trying to keep track of them. Ed's out front. And the cheater car, the 125 horsepower car, is out front. The bus had obviously more than 100 horsepower. Their penalty was if anybody broke down, they had to pick them up and carry them. And amazingly, no one really broke down except for one car that had an issue in Arizona. It was a Saturn, which is never a good choice for anybody. He was uh, the flying pistachio, it was called. And he came into a gas stop, went the wrong way, like where the trucks get filled up. And this happens a lot when you're cannonballing. A lot of those big truck stops out there, it's hard to figure out where the trucks go, where the cars go, especially if you're tired. And he was doing it alone. He was doing it. There were a couple of solo drivers, which is shocking. He tried to get over where the gas was. And the story is, I hear it, is that he hit the curb and like jumped the Saturn and it came down and he said it just sounded like the whole front end came apart. And he's like, oh boy, and then got his gas and it drove well for a little bit, then it started falling apart and he had to pull over. But every car finished, that car finished technically. He got a rental car and good on him in this tiny little town. And I think it was a rental car from a used car lot. Like they didn't have a rental place in it, the rent, the used car lot rented cars. He's like, I'm gonna drive to LA in this. And they're like, just pay the fee. He drove to the finish. To his credit, he drove back to his car, then came back and finished it. A mechanic had worked on it the next day. 
So kudos to him. That's the spirit that I'm after. That's the spirit of cannonball. That's the spirit of the musket ball. That kind of do it, enjoy it, finish it, love it, have fun. We had an absolute blast. And I got to say, you know, I've done 12 competitive cannonballs now and perfect events that I've thrown because everybody got there. And when the first team got there, they waited for the second team and they cheered them in and the next team and cheered them in, next team and cheered them in. As the group got bigger and bigger at the Portofino, everybody's drinking, have a good time, bringing them in. Everybody's having a good time and we're waiting. Now, there's always the last car, right? Take a wild guess what that was. If you're gonna drive a little Suzuki van with like a tiny little 600cc engine or something on freeways, and we were watching the little bugger and it's trucking. And like, again, the XM made it, which is shocking. And if, they, if an XM can make it, anybody can make it. And they're the little things kind of coming across, coming across and stops and they're coming across, coming across. You can see on the program how fast they're going and they're maxing out at like 65 miles an hour, 67 miles an hour. And they're sitting like shoulder to shoulder. This thing is tiny with the noise and trucks must have been pushing it around. We finished in like 35 hours or something like that. I don't care about times. I don't even remember what the, the fastest time was. It was like 32 hours. It was faster than I think Alex Roy or somebody. The, the goal was the, the league guys wanted to build the you know the beat one of the big times. Who cares? They did it. Good for them. But to me, it's about the slowest car. They come across. It's 30 hours. It's 40 hours. It's 50 hours. There's one dot left on the map, and down the road comes the little tiny Transcon Midivac. And I mean, people went nuts. Like you would have thought they would have picked the damn thing up and carried them around. It was magnificent. And as an organizer, alleged organizer of one of these events, the moment the last car comes in safely is the moment you can declinch. And you're like, okay, everybody's here. Everybody had a good time. Everybody made it safely. There were winners, there were losers. We had patches and t-shirts and hats. It's America, that's what you do things for, right? We had an award ceremony at the end and the award was the musket ball trophy, which the guys in the Passat actually made for us. And I, if you have a trophy, you spray paint it gold. So basically all the stuff I went and bought at the dollar store and made the trophies the day before and you spray paint it gold and you put a patch on it, done. The musket ball trophy, of course, is the big trophy. We had seven or eight trophies. I kept making trophies up because I want everybody to be a winner, right? It's summer camp. Everybody's a winner at the musket ball. And we gave it away for, you know, the people who gave the most help, the best of this and the best of that. And of course, the fastest uh, time. But the, the musket ball trophy, I never said what the musket ball trophy was for. I never said it was for the fastest time. And people, were, I think, were a little shocked at the end. The trophy for the fastest time was the smallest, crappiest one I could make. And then the guys who won the musket ball, of course, the Transcon Medivac. Because you did the most with the least. And that is musket balling. We love the team at Patrick Adair Designs because they make rings and other jewelry out of some of the most amazing and interesting materials on Earth and even occasionally from space. But they've honestly outdone themselves with their latest creation. They have made a series of rings using the aluminum that they cut out of an OEM wheel for a Bugatti Veyron. Obviously, I love the Bugatti Veyron, maybe one day, I hope, but they've also used forged carbon fiber, gold, and platinum to accent the rings however you want them. And honestly, as cool as the rings are, I think I like the case they come in even better. They have replicated the W16 engine on the top out of sterling silver. It's a cherry wood box with like carbon fiber and titanium screws, super duper cool. So check it out now at the link in the description below to get yourself a super cool ring from a great company, Patrick Adair Designs. And if you order now during the month of July, you'll also get free at checkout, either a carbon fiber ring or a tungsten pendant. So they've been a great supporter of Vinwiki all these years and they've created an awesome product here. So check it out now at the link in the description below.